nyali panjalangi rakol jugun nyali gani garama mala jugun we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land the panjalang people on whose land malambimbi stands we offer our deep respect to the elders past and present for their knowledge of how to live in harmony on this ancient land so the, the title of tonight's talk is Corporate Capitalism, the Violence and the Human Rights Indifference. And Professor Stuart Rees is a peace activist and author. He's an emeritus professor at the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Sydney. And he's director of the Sydney Peace Foundation. He's been a social worker in Britain and Canada and participated in war on poverty programs in the US and with Save the Children in India and Sri Lanka. And in 98 was conferred the award of highest honor for contributions to world peace by Sokpo University, Japan. So he's an extremely international gentleman. Um, he was also elected Fellow of the Senate at the University of Sydney and for six years was a member of the New South Wales Reconciliation Committee. In 2005, he was awarded the Order of Australia for Services to International Relations. His publications include over 100 journal articles, mainly in the areas of peace and conflict and social policy. And he's author and co-author of 10 books, um, the last of which were called Passion for Peace and Tell Me the Truth About War, but the very, very last has just come out and it has the beautiful title of The Lover's Country and it is actually a work of fact under the auspices of a book of fiction. So with that, let's welcome Professor Stuart Rees who's come all the way up from Sydney and a big round of applause for Stuart. Okay, well, look, thank you for having me in this beautiful part of the world. You'll notice that I'm passionate about this topic because we're really challenging the mainstream ways of thinking, which you will hear too much of in the, in the next few weeks in the, in the general election. The, the mainstream ways of thinking about economics or about the economy as though it is always at least 10 times more important than the crafting of a just society. I want to talk about the, first of all, the frame of mind that uh, businessmen and economists and politicians use to, uh, to talk about economies and societies. The first concept, so in other words, imagine that you're in conversation with them and you're trying to work out how they think, what they value, and we'll go on from that to see how they put these values and perspectives into effect. The first consideration is about profit. It's about something called the bottom line and the power that goes with making that, that profit. That's uh, a particularly crucial way of, of thinking. There's another concept that's related to that, it's called efficiency. I used to have a radio program in Sydney called Peace with Reefs, and when the Iraq war occurred, they took, they took me off the air because they said that during a war, nobody was interested in peace. But I used to argue that I was in favor of inefficiency because the, the undue respect paid to efficiency usually ignores the human costs. So this undue respect for efficiency, get rid of, get rid of um, uh, people, get rid of uh, crucial uh, social welfare, uh, educational health services in the interests of this phenomenon called efficiency. There's another concept in their thinking which has to do with the relationship between the public sector and the private sector. And mostly it's about uh, law, say, making laudatory remarks about the private sector and derisory remarks about the public sector. As though it's a kind of, you know, taken to an extreme, it's a sort of Lord of the Fly situation. Everybody for themselves and we finish up eating one another. So, uh, it's what the wonderful Naomi Klein calls disaster capitalism. Because with the notion of efficiency goes a form, it's an expression of violence in my, in my book. It's about saying that 
a certain proportion of the people here in the workforce are really of little consequence. They're not, they're not competitors in the race of life. That's a particular perspective. The, the, uh, uh, an ally to that is the idea that government and corporation should be mer somehow merged. They should be the same thing. It's, 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 uh, 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 thank you for that contribution from the floor. Um, uh, it's as though, you can see that in massive projects around Sydney at the moment. I'm not so familiar with Queensland. But uh, the West Connex um, road complex system is about companies uh, managing government. In fact, the idea is that uh, is that uh, we need to governments need to be efficient, sufficiently efficient to imitate the alleged best characteristics of companies. In fact, the argument goes that companies should be a great deal more powerful and influential than governments. There's, there's certain evidence that about 50 major corporate, the CEOs of 50 major corporations cross the Atlantic backwards and forwards and have got nothing to do with the governments of the nation state, but are trying to um, uh, protect their own interests. The stupid decision to open a huge Indian back coal mine adjacent to the Barrier Reef is, is one such example. So there's the, there's the, 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 these are the perspectives, this is the frame of mind that is being used to influence the policies. The second question then becomes, how do they put it into effect? And everybody in this audience is going to be pre pretty familiar with the concept of uh, privatisation. When in doubt, privatise the public sector on the grounds that it will be more efficient. Get, sell it off. Even Keating's appalling decision to flog off the Commonwealth Bank was in a way the start, the start of that process, although it had started before. The second uh, uh, concept is about deregulating the corporate sector. It means, look, we don't need any regulations. We can, we can inspect ourselves. I mean, Reagan started it when he deregulated the aircraft. The, the, the um, regulations about um, fly, rules for flying in America said so they could police themselves. It's a bit like, um, you know, making a fox responsible for the, hen, for, the, for the hen house. There's another concept which you'll be familiar with, which is about outsourcing. In other words, giving the jobs that were done by responsible members of the public to, to private corporations, even if the leaders of those corporations were once insiders in the government. And you can see that in particular in the privatisation of prisons, the privatisation of detention centres, the privatisation of the electricity industry, and the privatisation of water where and we didn't need Richard Hill's brilliant article in a recent edition of New Matilda to know that the Panama Papers, remember those of you who've got, um, who've got bank accounts in the Virgin Islands, look, are there, are there people, could you, you were perhaps, all here. perhaps oh, three people, sorry, three people, three people in the front row have got accounts in the Virgin Islands, because one of the key features of implementing that frame of mind is to be secret, to, be, to, to do it in the dark, to conceal it. That's why they don't want a Royal Commission into the banking industry, because it's meant to be. We know we are experts. The, the way you build a civil society is to have no respect for the claims made by experts. You, we're, all, we're all experts. We're the citizens with a responsibility. So now let me give some illustrations from, um, from uh, America, Britain, and Australia as to how, as to what are the consequences of this way of thinking. Remember I said it's a form of, a form of violence. In America, the, see the public sector largely has been replaced by core militaries. By, by police systems, by surveillance systems, by private security guard systems. One of, there are two measures of the revival of the American economy. 
One is the fast food industry, if that's on and up. It's meant to be a form of economic health. <laughs> Forget about obesity. Obesity. And the second is the is the is what is called the security industry, security politics. So Ameri in America, for example, uh, every third Afro-American male will have spent time in prison during their lifetime. They love imprisonment, the land of the free. Yeah. In the past three decades, past 30 years, they've spent uh, six times more on putting people in prison than they have on education. Oh. So this, this, the violence of the corporate way of thinking is a fascination with punishment and control. You'll see more examples as we go on. We turn to the UK, which has privatised just about everything, from the probation service to uh, police tasks such as investigation, and, uh, the, uh, and um, the containment of prisoners. You've all heard of a company called G4S, who, um, who, who's, who uh, demonstrated their complete incompetence at the London Olympics. And the, the public service and the army had to come in to replace them. But what's fascinating about this undue reverence for the private sector is that they get rewarded in spite of their incompetence. It's a bit like the CEO of the big company that goes bankrupt, and he, he or she is rewarded with a massive golden handshake. In most other, uh, in most other situations, you'd lose like a member of the, um, of the nickel industry in, in Queensland and for a time go home penniless. So the, the G4S, it demonstrates its incompetence but gets rewarded. And we love G4S in this country. Let's quick flip to, quick flip to, uh, to Australia, where we've privatised we, the, the, all the detention centres, not just the ones on Manus Island and Nauru. Tony Abbott gave $244 million to, um, to G4S to run Manus Island and Nauru. Invisible, if you remember, what was it called? Oper Operation Sovereign Borders. Remember the wretched uh, Morrison and had to sit behind, beside uh, an army chief and pretend that they were efficient and the, the rest of us didn't need to know. It was in what they were, the turning back the boats was, was an expression of violence, but it was invisible. Trust us, trust me, was the, was the claim. 244 million to G4S, who proved to be to, to be abusing prisoners, so they transferred the responsibility to um, Transfield and paid them 1.4 billion dollars to run Manus Island and, and Nauru. Transfield has subsequently um, uh, subcontracted to Wilson Wilson Security Industries Incorporated, who were named in the Panama paper, Papers and who are guilty of the abuses of um, uh, prison, the most vulnerable, some of the most vulnerable people in the world. A proportion of you on Monday night would have seen four corners in which the social workers and the doctors and the nurses who work on Manus Island are not allowed to say anything about the human rights abuses that they witness. Despite the doctors taking a Hippocratic oath and uh, so they can be punished. This is our regime. We, we, we are responsible for it. They can be punished with up to 20 years imprisonment for speaking out. Um, that's why in my, in my title, and thank you for reminding me what the title is tonight, because I'd forgotten what I was supposed to be speaking about. Uh, it's about the indif complete indifference to human rights. I mean, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was crafted after the war with the slogan, never again. It was partly prompted by the, by the Holocaust, but it was, meant to say, it was meant to be the highest aspirations of the common man and woman. That's not a bad, not a bad goal to try to achieve. But now that's regarded as, as, as subservient to commercial interests that are meant to be kept secret. I'm now going to turn to make comments about Israel because Australia has a very close and flourishing uh, exchange, uh, arms industry exchange with the government of Israel. 
And I want to talk about Israel because in the Q&A program the other evening, which was meant to be about innovation, and um, uh, one of Turnbull's slogans for the election is about him, he's going to be the innovation prime minister. And the, almost everybody on that program was saying, look, you've got to go to Israel or you've got to go to America to, if you want to learn about innovation. America, the land of the free, fascinated with spending a fortune on locking people up and punishing them. They, in Texas, where I once worked, they even tried to privatize capital punishment. <laughs> and the fund, when they asked for witnesses, this is the cruelty bit, this is the violence bit, when they asked for witnesses to an execution, the, the fundamentalist Christians in the Tea Party rushed to volunteer. <laughs> And of course, George Bush, and now I'm straying a bit, but you might, shall I stray for a bit? I mean, George Bush, I mean, George Bush and Tony Blair, are oh, pray, their God told them that over, over steak at the Crawford Ranch, that it was a good idea to invade uh, Iraq in 2003. Almost all of the innovations of the government of Israel depend on the military. It's a military culture. It has, it always has been. So it's about the sale of arms, it's about the uh, deployment of arms, it's about the testing of arms, it's about the sale of arms and s police and other surveillance material to some of the worst regimes in the world, and we collude with that. That's why the politicians, most of them, there are some brave exceptions, and members of the main me of the media are scared out of their wits to talk about the, cru the tragedy of the Palestinians and scared it out of their wits to talk about anything except uncritically the Israeli narrative. Not because of the sovereign state of Israel, whatever that means, but because they're all tied up with these commercial interests. Now having said that about the, about the, the manufacture and the testing of weapons, this is the huge corporate network around the world, promoted not just by Israel, but Israel's economy depends disproportionately on that. But it wouldn't be possible to manufacture, test, deploy, and sell these weapons if they did not have the occupation of the Palestinian lands. That is the test ground for, for discovering whether these weapons are any good. The, the occupation of the West Bank the con continued containment of millions of people in refugee camps since 1948 and the appalling siege of Gaza is, is maintained by a whole corporate uh, monopoly which in some in Naomi Klein's terms is called um, Uzi politics. <laughs> Uzi being the uh, machine gun. It's called security politics. And the great guard security, we hear that all, we hear that all the time. The third feature of this that I want to, uh, of this, uh, the reason I'm focusing on Israel, uh, because it's not, in a way, it's not just Israel, it's about Israel's interdependence with some cowardly regimes, the United States, Britain, some often the European Union, and Australia. On the, on the Israeli issue in the Security Council, ever since it was born, the Americans, whenever a, a resolution sl even slightly critical of the brutality of the government of Israel, I'm not talking about the people of Israel, towards the Palestinians, the Americans have used the veto 43 times. That's more than any of the, any of the other members of the Security Council put together. And there is a camouflage that is used to pull the wool over your eyes. And it gets used every night on the television, on the radio, and in the, Austra in the Australian, often in the gutless Sydney Morning Herald. I won't say, I don't, don't know anything about the Courier, I'm sure that's a wonderful newspaper. <laughs> and it's about the claim that we're protecting our way of life. We're protecting our system, our democracy, our liberalism, our respect for human rights. We are, we're all, I mean, Netanyahu says it every time, he said, I'm one of you. I'm against terrorism. We're all against terrorism. I mean, the evidence in my, in my 
years of study is that the worst terrorists in the world over the past 50 years have been people wearing the uniforms of governments. I mean, that's in terms, if you want to do a body count of who's lost their lives and who's been tortured beyond belief, we could do an appalling little vignette of Saudi Arabia, one of the best allies of the West. Then you have to look at the, I'm not, I'm not giving, I'm not <laughs> trying to explain away um, the uh, uh, appalling events that are going on around the world. But one of the reasons they're going on is that is the failure to bring justice to the people of Palestine. If I was a cancer specialist and any of you came to me with secondary growths, I'd want to know where the primary site was. And the primary site in international relations has been the failure to bring justice to the Palestinians. Yeah. Now, at the time I've, time I've got left, ten minutes or nine? Nine. Nine, okay. Any advance on nine? Okay. Uh, I just want to say, well, what are we, how, how are we supposed to react? It's, it's, you know, um, and one of the reactions is going to depend on your questions. I mean, clearly, we, the language we use and the values that inform that language have to be a part of the debate. A mate of mine, wonderful Frank Stilwell, prof professor of economics at Sydney, we once wrote, at Kim Beasley's re request, we wrote a paper for the Labour Party on how universal human rights could affect foreign and domestic policies. And Beasley said it was a good idea, and that's, that's, that's all we heard about it. We didn't hear any more. But clearly, we have to talk about the values inherent in those documents, in the Geneva Convention, in the rules of international law. You know, when those, aer when those Russian airplanes flew over the over the American aircraft carrier, Julie Bishop and others were jumping up and down saying, this is an abrogation of international law, beating our chests. But when it comes to the Israelis stealing more and more Palestinian land, she says she doesn't know what, what international law prohibits it. So there's an exception to the rule. My question is, why, this is not about the abolition of the State of Israel, because in my view, the, um, justice for the Palestinians would have been the best form of security for the Israelis. Instead of a massive investment in punishment and control and arms and incessant killing, in particular of the people of Gaza. So we have to use that language. We have to, I think, question what is meant by sovereignty. I think some of the sovereignty about, you know, Operation Sovereign Borders. Who the hell cares? when a pandemic could, 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 uh, would, could, wouldn't respect any borders, and when, when the, the key moral issue of the age, one of the key moral issues, the destruction of a fragile but precious environment, knows no respect of borders. So we have, to, we have to think differently about the sovereignty of all peoples and all living things, not, this, not spending $50 billion on submarines. Uh, yeah. I want to I, so I want to finish with in a way a commercial but I, I, I wrote this book because um, in 2002 2003 there was a murder in East Jerusalem and a massacre in a refugee camp in Jenin and the United Nations nobody was allowed to investigate uh, Kofi Annan was the Secretary General of the United Nations the UN were not allowed to go in a friend of mine, or somebody, I, somebody who's become a great friend, a brilliant, powerful, articulate Palestinian leader, Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, a, a Christian in a Muslim world, a woman in a man's world, um, knew about these events. And so Australia had only one international prize for peace at that time, uh, the, the Sydney Peace Prize, and we decided to award her the Sydney Peace Prize. In the previous six years, we had had great people winning the prize, and nobody batted an eyelid. People like uh, Archbishop Tutu, Professor Muhammad Yunus, Sir William Dean, people, you know, it was consensus. 
doesn't ch consensus change nothing. And at that time, we had about a quarter of a million dollars. This is about the, the financial dimension. We were paid by seven of the biggest companies in Australia, Rio Tinto, um, uh, Publishing Broadcasting Limited, uh, the National Australia Bank, um, uh, City Bank, City Group, which was the biggest bank in the world at that time, they paid us between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars a year to put our logo on their material, so that they will feel morally good. But when we awarded the Peace Prize to a Palestinian, all the hell was let loose. Um, uh, death threats, uh, hate mail by the by the volume. I was shouted at by leading barristers at the Sydney Bar, why didn't you give the prize to Saddam Hussein, is what they told me. Uh, I was told that uh, if I didn't stop her from coming, we would lose all of a quarter of a million dollars. Everything you've ever worked for, you will lose. And I remember Robert Fisk, the wonderful, the wonderful journal, journalist for the Independent who lives in Beirut, writing that the that, that particularly powerful lobby are at it again, and these people in Australia will be crushed in the same way that everybody else has been. And um, I had one friend in that, one particular friend in that dispute, and it was a guy called Alan Ramsey, who was the brilliant political journalist of the, of the Sydney Morning Herald, the most gutsy, the most gutsy political journalist I've come across since I've been living in this country. And, um, uh, every time I was told, I got phone calls saying, you've got to give up on this, you must be nuts, you're going to lose everything. And I said, I'm, if we, I don't care if we only have one cent left, you can't, if we give way on this, we will stand for nothing. And, um, and uh, in the end, I, I was so appalled by what was going on, I had federal police protection for three months. <laughs> Uh, that I recorded one of the conversations and I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I gave it to Ramsey and said, look, I don't know how you're going to use this, but uh, you, might, you might want to give uh, some illustrations from this conversation from the, um, the, uh, the chair of the foundation who was trying to make me give up. I don't know how you're going to use this, but you can keep quiet about it, but here it is. And the next Saturday, I was down the coast in my home, and the phone went very early in the morning, and a mate of mine said, Christ, Stuart, I know you've got balls, but it's all over the Sydney Morning Herald. He printed the whole lot, the whole, the whole of this conversation. So um, when I was back in Gaza and on the West Bank, I met, uh, before he died, the great poet of the Palestinians, Mahmoud Darwish, who written a poem, uh, in which he said that he hoped one day, even from rubble, we should build a lover's country. And um, what a brilliant concept. So to in total contrast with some of the things, the concern with prisons, with police surveillance, with drone, with the manufacture of drones, let alone the payment of submarines. So here's the book. It's a reveal all now. It's entirely in fiction, but the libel lawyers have, re have read it carefully. Um, and I'm happy to reveal who's who in question time. <laughs>